Well, hello, that's me again, it's August 11, so, and let's not put things uh, away for too long, and let's start uh, with immediate answer uh, to question which everybody, uh, you know, tortures me with since yesterday, and uh, uh, including the bunch of the trolls and uh, all those other herpes, you know, which pretends to be... Uh, you know, uh, contributors to any kind of discussion about these explosions. Actually, they, I believe there were two or three in the military air, um, airfield in Saki in Crimea. And of course, as you might expect, Ukraine immediately, you know, uh, tried to get the credit for itself for that, including obviously its MI6 curators, especially from this clownish uh, MI6 outlet, uh, Bellingcat. But, uh, and obviously immediately the doctored Photoshop uh, photo started to appear online. But the point is actually that the most likely, most likely two uh, scenarios, and even now even uh, Moscow even denies this scenario of the diversionary act, which is essentially a terrorist act, and, uh, but most likely could be actually the negligence. And there was one person killed and uh, something like 14 wounded, among them like six uh, uh, heavily, I don't know. So we'll, we'll have more information about it, but uh, it didn't disrupt really much, except of course for the large uh, damage, primarily for the windows and the cars which were um, around, but let FSB deal with this. It has nothing to do with any kind of missiles or Russian air defense or what have you. It's the same as was an attack by the small drone with the basically a regular grenade attached to it on the uh, uh, headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol. It was obviously inside job and it was conducted within the uh, city limits. And not only city limits, I, I, I can actually guess from where it was conducted. The range of it, of Sevastopol itself, by some kind of the... There are obviously all kinds of networks there. There are still a lot of... Um, Ukrainian nationalists operating undercover there, or simply just disgruntled nationalists who live in, uh, they would like to get, you know, Russian pay, but still hate Russians. So, yeah, it's all possible. Uh, let's um, let FSB and Ministry of the Internal Affairs deal with this. Now, they're going back to our, so to speak, goals. Um, Evidently, Mr. Schultz is really living in the alternative universe because he um, urges Russia to take back turbine, and uh, obviously Russia is not going to take it back, and Germany has to deal with this. And again, uh, anybody who thinks so that um, the country which supplies uh, weapons, which also attack Russian uh, territory, by the way, uh, to the regime, and which is actually outright, you know, Nazi regime, neo-Nazi regime, and they think that Russia should supply them with uh, gas or what have you, that's called force majeure, guys, and so Mr. Scholz really have to check his brain, you know, and obviously the other funniest thing which happened there was the fact that somebody... Uh, uh, during his press, uh, yesterday I believe, asked him what will be when you think Mr. Putin will come to Berlin to meet Mr. Schultz. I mean, to start with, what kind of question is that? It's a sheer idiocy, and uh, Mr. Putin is not going to visit some guy who is a lap dog and poodle, basically, who is nobody. And obviously, in this particular case, they just do it, you know, to make sure and feel themselves great that Germany is still matter still matters. It doesn't. I understand they really have different ideas about it, but it's it just the way it is. And again, uh, as I already stated, most of the economics, quote unquote, which comes from primarily Western universities and Western economic schools, is baloney. It's a fake pseudoscience, basically, and uh, they cannot find even their own ass with their both hands in the bright little room because they basically operate in the alternative universe of GDPs and financial indices, which are absolutely worthless. Germany cannot exist without Russian energy, and Russia is not going to supply it now because obviously why should Russia uh, talk to people who steal their uh, 300 billion of Russian uh, um, uh, currency and gold uh, uh, possessions, so to speak. So you don't talk to thieves. You 
persecute them basically that's what it is and so germany has to resign itself that it's not going to exist as we know it uh, for much longer so that's the ma main part but let's talk now uh, a little bit back to my previous video when i was talking about the um, isr and space-based assets and uh, this is very important because obviously as you might understand a bunch of the experts quote unquote uh, and there are many of them lur lurking around me for you just to know that I have upward of 2 million visitors on my blog alone so and people obviously watch my videos some watching them in the kind of you know lurking mode so and there are many people from uh, Ukrainian and uh, other intel services from Great Britain United States obviously who watch this and once I started di discussing the issue of the satellite base intel and targeting immediately the bunch of the ipsoids or as they call the uh, psyop uh, people started to appear you know around my blog and started to post all kinds of crap uh, basically in their uh, comments so in this uh, case I want to uh, kind of immediately uh, stop this uh, trash from reappearing that guys no matter how you try most of you have no education or expertise about this and whatever you try to pretend that Russia doesn't have good ISR uh, you better learn the subject and I know you can't because you don't have uh, education and background it requires a lot of physics a lot of math and a lot of clearances namely to the classified information which you don't have I don't have the last one anymore I used to have Form 1A, which was, uh, you know, basically, well, allowed me to, uh, the same as anybody officer who graduated from the Naval Academies, in particular case, if we talk about uh, uh, Soviet Navy, to look uh, and be privy to the extremely classified. I'm not talking about top secret, I'm talking about Asobai Vajnistri, which is, means special significance. It's, uh, I believe what in the United States, what is the even analog of that? It's cold word or something like that, for your eyes only, I don't know. But yeah, that's the level of, because obviously when you have the access to the, uh, at that time, most advanced weapon systems, uh, you kind of, you know, just the way it is so guys don't try you are not good enough go back to your humanities uh, education learn some things which you can use in your life except, in, except uh, instead of uh, basically trashing most of the blogs and you know or just go visit all, you know all those uh, YouTube military experts who know nothing and wouldn't be able to to tell the shit from Shinola and they basically do the circle jerk on the shiny military toys but speaking of those shiny military toys and uh, targeting and space-based assets uh, of Russia and obviously we, we know what United States does but uh, about Russia in continuation of the basically uh, what I was talking in the last video I love fusion no not only jazz jazz rock fusion it, it, it's jazz rock which is of course later have been called uh, fusion to uh, remove kind of jazz and rock uh, you know identities from it I still love fusion I love it I mean I oh my god I mean from tribal tech to Valery Stepanov to just love it you know I love Miles Davis when he was doing his beaches brew and things of this nature so but this is not the fusion I'm talking about although they are related and um here let me demonstrate it for you look at this as i already stated uh, and we've been talking about the uh, uh how to say it uh targeting uh, so to speak for a long time but let me uh, tell you about uh, not only targeting but also the uh, uh issue of the net centricity and when people begin to talk you know vax you know technical about this like Oh my God, net centricity, network centric warfare, and then suddenly they pop like bang, you know, sensor fusion. Then there are probability fusions. And they're like, oh, what is that? You know, there's some, something absolutely mysterious. No, not really, actually. And the same as in the jazz rock, which is called fusion nowadays, it's fusing of number of things. And let me give you one of the examples. And this is example from my book and uh, the second book. But look at this. If you look at this uh, uh, picture, and if you imagine that there is a fog about the lake, above the lake, and there is some uh, little vessel, you know, is somewhere in the lake. You have observer one, 
O1 and observer 2, O2, and at some point of time, while not seeing the ship on the lake, the ship gives the whistle, you know, the vessel just whistles, you know, and both observers hear it. Of course, they cannot immediately uh, pinpoint the position of this uh, vessel in the lake, but if you give them the ability, so to speak, to draw the sectors within which they heard, that means the general direction within which they heard this whistle of this vessel, and you plot it on the, anyway, a piece of paper, map, what have you, you will see yourself that it creates this kind of, uh, uh, you know, quadrangle, A, B, C, D, with which we can say with some degree of probability this vessel will be located. And it's a classic example. And suddenly, it's not just the lake, you know, it's some, uh, some segment of the lake where this vessel is located, and just plotting this, we can say, ha, ah, now we know approximately where it is located. But of course, we, this is a very, very uh, kind of crude example, but guess what? You just kind of defined or found the position of your vessel. And obviously it's inaccurate, but it's position nonetheless. So that's scientific warfare in this particular case, and uh, especially the sensor fusion, which I will be talking about, they serve one very, very important purpose. In fact, it's the most important pur purpose they uh, serve. It is the resolution of the uncertainties. And that's why I'm constantly on, uh, 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 on record that saying that war, as any other activities, actually, is a probabilistic matter. And everything we do in our life has probabilities. We, you know what, uh, you can go uh, to McDonald's, for example, in drive through and there are all kinds of probabilities Im immediately begin to, uh, and uncertainties, by the way, begin to unfold. If you talk about in the layman's uh, 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 language, for example, if I want to go to some McDonald's at lunchtime at 12, you know, there, there is uncertainty there. Will there be a huge line or in drive through or will be there a small line? Here's your certain uncertainty. You need to resolve it. Guess how it is being resolved? There are apps now which tell you that, hey, you you can look up there, uh, basically, with very high degree of uh, certainty, the lines in the uh, McDonald's drive-thru, local McDonald's drive-thru. Or you look, can look up the uh, traffic, and then you will see there, too, you know. So, as you can see yourself, it's all about uncertainty. But how does uncertainty look like? Here's how uncertainty look like. You see this? This one, uncertainty, is uh, obviously a basic uh, geometrical representation of the uncertainty when you begin to look at the position of some target, which as you can see yourself, the big fat uh, uh, red dot. And uh, as you can see yourself, we begin to get the, what is called instrumental plus obviously environmental, uh, all kinds of other errors. Uh, which create this uncertainty, and you can say, oh, I cannot position this uh, uh, specific uh, thing, specific target, in this uh, position where it is, because of the number of the factors which influence that, and as you can see yourself, it will be located in the A, B, C, D, uh, so to speak, uh, 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 figure, shaded, and you'll say, yeah, it's located there, but is it enough? for you to develop the precise targeting and, uh, you know, to develop, which is, of course, bearing and range, in this particular case, uh, to shoot at it. Well, it depends, of course. And obviously, the basic math and basic uh, human uh, uh, experience come very handy here when we begin to discuss about what is uncertainty and how this is resolved. And um, the sense of fusion is one of those things which resolve it. If you uh, can take a look at this, you will immediately understand what I'm talking about. Look attentively at this famous uh, uh, piece of the um, uh, Alberts Garska and uh, other group of people who wrote in 1999 this uh, excellent paper on their um, uh, network-centric warfare. And look what they show here. They show some kind of estimated launch point of some kind of missile. 
And as you can see yourself, it is ballistic missile. We assume it is ballistic missile. It looks like ballistic trajectory to us, parabolic, so to speak. And here it is. But look at this, what they uh, show you here. They show you here some very bizarre figure. If you look attentively at the initial state vector position, and you can see the first uh, lower left uh, uh, red arrow, it shows you tridimensional ellipse, oval. Hmm, okay. So the missile flies, flies, and then you begin to see that actually this oval, tridimensional egg, so to speak, begins to shrink. It begins to shrink and becomes smaller and smaller, and as you can see yourself, the, the fusion cues, and then of course the last uh, black dash, you can see it's called fusion. And fusion happens, and suddenly at the approach, you can see that this ellipse absolutely shrunk to almost the point. And that happens after we turned our kind of fusion, and uh, the closer it gets, obviously, the less and less errors uh, and deviations we have. And we suddenly have the exact position of the, in this particular case, missile, and we can shoot at it because we can uh, very well de uh, detect and be very certain about its position to develop our firing solution on this missile. So you'll say, huh, how does it work, really? Well, we'll take a look another, uh, uh, at uh, another picture. As you can see yourself, three different heterogeneous sensors position on the left picture show you how your range error and downrange and cross range, the segments are very large. Look at them. It's uh, one of them is five, another one them is one, and this is if we take the uh, information separately from three different sensors uh, and uh, we don't fuse it. But look at this. Here's the fuse uh, sensor position estimate. Uh, look at this. We practically reduce downrange uh, error but five times. And we also reduce cross-range error. And suddenly uh, the position of our target is not this bizarre figure, which is the intersection of three different positions, so to speak, provide, uh, provided by those sensors. But when they fuse, they are fused. Look at this. You suddenly have almost a point. And it's much easier to, uh, that's why we call it pinpointed. We can pinpoint it and suddenly we have the exact position which allows us to develop firing solution when we intercept uh, our missiles, for example, or any kind of other target, be that uh, armor personnel carrier or ship. So, but what is fusion then? Well, fusion, let's give it definition. And here's the definition of our fusion. Look at this. This is sensor fusion definition. And the definition is very good. It's really a good one. And look what it reads you. Sensor fusion is the process of combining data from multiple physical sensors in real time, while also adding information from mathematical models to create an accurate picture of the local environment. A system can then use this data to plan and act toward an objective or destination. Sensor fusion is an important part of the design of the autonomous systems. As you can see here, you see there are a bunch of the sensors on your modern cars. Look at this. And you have all kinds of things which you can stick to this car and be this LiDAR, which is laser uh, radar, basically long range radar. You know, you can uh, see all kinds of, stick all kinds of the optical uh, means there and bang, suddenly you have this very, very uh, interesting combination of those sensors, which you need to have a specific mathematical a protocol which is called sensor fusion. It's not just simply plugging in those uh, sensors into computer and saying, hey, we have sensor fusion. No, that's not it, what it is. To put it uh, uh, in a simpler words, sensor fusion is basically it's a combination or combining of several arrays of information or data which is sensor produced and fusing them by means of the mathematical protocol, which is, of course, a very complex uh, math there. We're dealing there with a lot of matrices, and uh, we deal there with a lot of errors and uh, deviations which need to be addressed. But just to give you an example, 
even in the old times, which is still today, although radar improved dramatically since then, but look at, uh, 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 radar were always re reliable in terms of range. In terms of bearing, the best way when you were navigating near the shores or in g distance which allows you to have a range at the, um, for example, uh, uh, some kind of shore facilities to, and uh, let's say, bay, beacon, lighthouse, you can always get the range very accurately, but it was preferred to get the uh, bearing or azimuth, if you wish, to it by means of op um, optical bearing finders. And when you combine them, you would get much, a much more accurate position of your ship than, for example, if you would be doing this uh, by uh, radar alone. It doesn't mean that you couldn't use the radar data strictly. No, you still could use it, but and it would have been good enough, but it would have less uh, probability of the accuracy, so to speak, in this uh, particular case. I can produce you, uh, I can give you another uh, uh, example of the... Um, uh, sensor fusion, which for those people who watch the criminal uh, shows about crime and everything, here, here it is. Uh, for example, if uh, your police uh, looks for some uh, criminal, he robbed somebody or, God forbid, killed somebody, murdered somebody, one of the best ways to do it is, guess what, to look up their uh, cell phone. And you, if you can get the, get the ping from the cell phone tower, suddenly you can say, ah, what is the vicinity? That the murderer was in the vicinity of this specific cell, uh, cell tower. Oh, that means it's basically a range. It's a circle, rather circumference, which you can take the uh, uh, compass and draw this circle, and that will be your vicinity where the uh, murderer was. But it's still not enough, obviously. You have only one parameter, the distance within which the murderer was from, for example, uh, place of murder. But after that, you go and you do what? You go to the street where the murder has been committed and you begin to ask, uh, obviously, uh, neighbors. You ask them what did they see, whom did they see, and things of this nature. And suddenly, you know, oh, okay, this murderer not only was within the range or within the vicinity, but it begins to pinpoint him to a very specific location on some street where the murder was co uh, committed. And suddenly you have, oh, you committed, or you just made this sensor fusion. You use the electronic means of detection by cell tower, by defining the range of this uh, guy, and then you provide, you got uh, uh, yourself second what is called a line of deposition. The first line of deposition was, of course, the what this circumference. Second one was the uh, basically pretty much verbal data from the neighbors who saw specific car of the murderer or murderer himself and that when you have two uh, uh, types of data completely different completely heter heterogeneous which one is electronic another is verbal you fuse it and you suddenly get the position of a very precise position of your uh, murderer and that's how you arrest the one so but how do we deal with this in, in real life, obviously? Because we need to understand that, hey, uh, position and those uncertainties are good, and we just, for example, as in, in the case with the uh, uh, murderer, we resolved our uncertainty. How do we really do this? And here's the thing. Many people <laughs> don't understand that. It's not that simple that you, oh, yeah, we get the bearing, distance, or range, azimuth, what have you. You know, oh, yeah, we got the target position. No, modern uh, computers, modern radar, modern uh, uh, acoustic sonars, modern what have you, they have a very serious processing power compared to, for example, what it was even 30 or 40 years ago. And then suddenly, instead for, let's say, watch officer or uh, commanding officer of the ship running or his, uh, you know, weps guy, weapons guy, running like crazy with all those tables and calculators, calculating the probabilities and resolving uncertainties, uncertainties you can suddenly do this by means of the uh, mathematical, serious mathematical protocols which are conducted by the... Um, um, computers.
BDM computers which are already uh, pre-installed, the processors which are pre-installed on first um, uh, radar or any other uh, kind of uh, uh, other sensor or sensing uh, 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 technology, which obviously usually tied to the central combat information control system, which does it for you. Believe me, they were doing this for you since 1960s, guys. And uh, you will say, huh, how does this help us? Well, it was happening <laughs> fairly slow, but that that was happening and for example if you look at the uh, this photo this is uh, from early 1980s this is the uh, uh, basically command radar post of one of the uh, Oliver Hazard Perry uh, frigates of the US Navy as you can see yourself a lot of screens a lot of buttons a lot of everything including the central console between these two other screens and this is basically what is uh, the central console of the combat information control system which gathers all this information from all those sensors be them radar be them sonar be them optical what have you and we was fusing them and you were getting their um very good reliable uh, uh, picture of the battle space and guess what uh, if you think so that Soviets <laughs> didn't have it well I have news for you my guys uh, Soviet Union was using the uh, unlike it was stated by many uh, basically uh, fanboys was using sensor fusion essentially which was in this particular case per, uh, processed by the central combat information control system i just give you example here's for uh, here's the 1968 uh, photo of soviet uh, uh, central console of the soviet uh, uh, system which is called lia Ale aleya aleya or la it was the system which was installed for example on the first uh, kiev Russia, uh, Soviet uh, air, ca bear, uh, air carrying cruiser, which uh, for the first time saw the, it was commissioned in 1976, I believe. This was Alea, and this is, was one of its uh, main consoles, which of course uh, was gathering through the uh, very primitive by today's standard computers, was gathering everything. Just to give you an example, for in 1981, when I was on Kiev, and not only me, the Alea provided, while being in Sevastopol, provided excellent battle space awareness, uh, for example, in uh, Mediterranean Sea. Of course, using uh, Soviet satellite uh, uh, recon systems, and you could turn on the, uh, basically, the screen, and you would see not only the, uh, basically, some of the U.S. Navy and NATO Navy's ships or carrier task groups, but those uh, systems, since then, since the very, uh, very early age, they, they were able to combine and fuse this information and present you with the very good, combined, and very precise, with less uncertainty, picture of the battle space, which allowed you to uh, uh, conduct the battle space uh, uh, operations, basically fighting the war, while being situationally aware. But here's more to it than that. If you look attentively at this, it is an ellipse, isn't it? And when people say uh, to me, well, yeah, what is uncertainty? How do you resolve this? And what do you do generally when you get, uh, let's say, the uh, range and data nowadays? Very simple. If you look at the most uh, modern uh, radar, which, uh, you know, not most modern, most radar starting from uh, 2000, since uh, Russia especially uh, dropped a lot of uh, veil of secrecy from uh, its technology, you will always uh, find the errors it gives, for example, in percentages in terms of range and errors in terms of the uh, 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 azimuth or bearing. Uh, it sometimes could be like 1%, could be 0.2%, what have you, but you will always know that uh, if you listen to my lectures, uh, that uh, essentially when we look at the, any kind of uncertainty, it's usually not really some kind of the uh, rectangular figure or quadrangular figure or even triangle. If you want to operate and resolve uncertainties and provide proper probability, which is acceptable for you, you will have to deal with the ellipse, which of course ellipse is the, uh, uh, the uh, geometric figure, which has two main parameters. It's uh, called the major axis, which is A, the longest one, and it has the minor axis, which is B, which is the shortest one. 
And if you take a look at this ellipse, and I'm not going to be going into the mathematics of it, but you can see also that this ellipse and its major, it's kind of slanted relative to the, in this particular case, N stands for the uh, north, true north, which is everything in uh, military is conducted by north, which is either azimuth or bearing. They are measured relative to the true north, which is an angle. And as you can see yourself, we have this alpha angle to which this uh, ellipse slanted, so to speak, or inclined. And you may say, what is this? Well, ellipse is this. As you can see yourself, this is how you get the normal distribution on uh, probabilities of where your targets, depending on your uh, 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 accuracy and errors and interferences, could be located. They are located using this formula. The probability of location of your target in this ellipse will be 1 minus E, or you know this by now, exponent, minus C2, C squared, over 2. You will say, huh, what is this C thing? Well, let me explain what is the, uh, what is this C thing is. So, the uh, C is... It's basically the uh, one third of the what is called three sigma ellipse, and this is the uh, C, which uh, we can get uh, uh, in terms of the basic uh, what is called average quadratic ellipse of errors. And if uh, your ellipse is has C equals one, that means your major uh, uh, axis A equals the major axis of this uh, quadratic, uh, uh, average quadratic ellipse, uh, and B equals, large B equals its minor uh, 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 axis. Then the formula, for example, in this particular case, you will have the probability of 0 0.393 of your uh, target being located within this ellipse. If, for example, we get, begin to increase our uh, axes, axis, if you wish, of our ellipse where our uh, uh, target could be located. If we take C equals 2, that means A large equals 2A and B equals 2 small, uh, lowercase b, which is called double, uh, 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 double average uh, uh, quadratic ellipse, then probability of the, uh, our target like, uh, located in this ellipse already will be uh, much higher it will be 0 0.865. But of course, if we take this C3 ellipse, where is it is, for example, uh, uh, we have the A equals 3A uh, uh, lowercase and B equals 3B uh, lowercase, which is triple uh, average quadratic ellipse, then the probability of our target or our sh own ship located in this ellipse will be 0. 989. Aha! Uh -huh. That is a really good probability of having something uh, uh, in there, you know? And obviously, this is the probability where you can actually start dealing with your uh, uh, good level of the, um, let's say, uh, uh, targeting and developing of the firing solution. For example, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if we uh, talk about the uh, uh, probability of locating our ship or our car or what have you in the ellipse and we need to that true uh, position ellipse with the major uh, with uh, 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 what is called the uh, semi-axis let's say one semi-axis a uh, equals 6.5 miles and the other minor uh, semi-axis equals 5.0 miles then when we begin to look at what will be our uh, uh, axis of the uh, uh, average uh, quadratic ellipse of the A lower and B lower, then it will be 2.6 miles and uh, uh, 2.0 uh, miles. And from here, if we uh, calculate the uh, basically those ratios for C, and C equals A uh, large over A small equals 2.5, 6.5 divided by 2.6, or 
uh, equals C by measuring B equals 5.0 divided by 2.0 again equals 2.5 then we will be able to say that actually the uh, uh, probability of, of uh, our true position be that our ship or uh, our uh, target will be 0 0.956 which is decent probability it's really good probability you can work with that but of course your ellipse is fairly large and in order for it to shrink it that's when we do this uh, fusion and uh, as I already described it, uh, it's an extremely important mathematical process which allows you to shrink those ellipses to a very small form. As I already point, uh, pointed or showed you in the picture from uh, an eccentric warfare book by Garska and Alberts, you get uh, in the, th the three different sense of fusion, <clears throat> you get a very small really uh, uh, point and you get obviously your accuracy and your uh, you reduce your uncertainty dramatically and that's what allows modern systems and of course i'm not getting you into the mathematics of it i'm trying to simplify it almost vulgarize it to the such point that everybody understands it when we do the sensor fusion and do it properly and of course mathematics matters here and some processing power it doesn't have to be something super pooper super computer but you can still use supercomputers then suddenly you get a very accurate picture and you can act upon it you can develop firing solution you can uh, also uh, uh, have the a precise position and this is how by the way work most of the recon space-based system they provide all kinds of sensor fusion and already fused data goes for example as you already uh, and i spoke about this like in russia in uh, uh, central um, uh, command post or the central command post of armies it could be in moscow it could be somewhere outside in the field and it provides you with an extremely accurate uh, uh, situation uh, and battle space awareness and that's what provides you the most important thing it resolves uncertainties and allows you to develop the firing solution that's what really matters huh so this was my kind of introductory part on this uh, uh very complex issue but i wanted you just to know that yes uh, war is a complex affair and so is the space recon and uh, basically isr and that's what is this all about this that is why we can still use what is called diversionary intel recon groups which go close to the enemy lines we have obviously space recon we have radar we even have acoustic means of detections we have all those optronic means infrared ultra ultraviolet what have you and it is all today unlike it was actually during the times of the world war ii and as somebody says you know that john fisher admiral you know uh, of the royal navy the famous man behind uh, dreadnoughts who introduced this kind of thing uh, like uh, i disagree with this but yeah it's uh, uh, what is called uh, net network centric warfare and it was dealing already with trying to resolve uh, uncertainties long time ago but it only now starting from the night the late 70s when it became absolutely crucial and it works well for some people it will be miracles but again it is very complex mathematics that's what they teach you in the serious naval or military academies that's the education you get and that's how you go out in the field and that's how you command modern troops i'm not talking about the troops of the vietnam era or uh, let alone world war ii or in korea so, and that's what I wanted to do today in terms of presentation. And we will continue this. I know there will be many um, questions and there will be many trolls as usual. So I will tell trolls that I will be, uh, basically just uh, delete them. But people will be asking questions and I will continue to answer them through my blog and maybe obviously providing some data in my videos. So this is what I wanted to tell you about today. and. Uh, as always, those who are interested, uh, please support my channel by means of subscribing and people who can afford, uh, please support me on the Patreon. And I'm thinking now to sticking this, uh, whatever the button with the dollar sign in YouTube. I don't have monetization on YouTube, but I will try to stick it to, to my videos. So, 
and this is what I wanted to tell you today and I'll talk to you later guys have the nice uh, uh, rest of your week bye bye <laughs>